All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. We're going to have an abbreviated catechism hour this morning because we've had uh, the joy of the baptism today and enjoyed fellowship and reception together. Um, but I wanted to just uh, spend a little time talking with you about um, something I'm going to be uh, reading. It's a part of the prayer book we've not used before, um, at least in my knowledge, we've not used it before. It's a couple of the exhortations before Holy Communion. And so one of the reasons why we're going to be having a morning prayer next week is to give us the time and the space uh, to be able to read these exhortations before Holy Communion. Um, these, uh, the first, uh, now, we, well, I'll say more about that in just a second. So uh, before I say that, let's, uh, let's go ahead and open in prayer together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by your grace, uh, you give us the things that we need. We pray that we would always fix our eyes on you. That we would fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And that we would uh, walk uh, with you now and throughout our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so generally, the practice of our parish, as you know, is to be a, a weekly communion parish. We're, we're uh, a weekly Eucharist parish, that's, uh, and I'm not planning on changing that. Um, we are going to continue, continue to be a weekly communion parish. I do want to introduce from time to time, perhaps it will be on fifth Sundays, Today's actually the fifth Sunday of, of January, and I had planned at one point to do morning prayer today, but when we set the baptism to, for today, I wanted to have communion on the baptism day. And so um, maybe it'll be fifth Sundays, or, which is about quarterly. Um, we'll have a morning prayer together, um, and sometimes morning prayer with litany. Um, I think one thing that we need to think about and consider, one of the reasons I'm thinking about um, having morning prayer as part of our rotation is that as a weekly communion parish, and again, that's not something I'm planning on changing. Um, I'm planning on us being a weekly Eucharist parish. Um, but one thing I think that can be one temptation of it is that we can perhaps be tempted to not remember what it is that we're doing when we're coming to the Holy Communion. The reason why we have the Holy Communion regularly is because we're by it acknowledging our need. By it, we're acknowledging what it is that the Lord has done for us, who we are before him, and that he offers himself to us by grace. But the prayer book um, has a, a couple of passages, a couple of, of extended, where they're called exhortations, that remind us um, of how we're supposed to be disposed when we come to communion. That we are to be, um, as uh, we're going to see in just a second, religiously and devoutly disposed when we come to communion. Which means that when we come to Holy Communion, we are to come in repentance and in faith. Um, now, if you have a prayer book there handy, I'm not actually going to read them all today. Because we have an abbreviated catechism hour today. And so I'm actually, I would like you, if you can, this week to read them. Uh, before I read them next Sunday. But the, the two exhortations particularly I'm going to be reading next Sunday are found on page 86, 87, 88, and 89 of the prayer book. These are the second and third exhortations. The first exhortation, if you flip back to page 85, you'll know that we do say that exhortation in our parish uh, with some regularity. What are the days when we say that exhortation? Does anybody know? First Sunday in Advent, first Sunday in Lent, at least, um, and Trinity Sunday. So those are the ones uh, we typically three times a year. It can be used more often than that, but we do do it, according to what the rubric says, those three times of the year. But if you flip over to page 86, there is a, a, a second exhortation that can be used that we've not used here before, but I am going to use next, next week. And then if you flip the page again, there's a third exhortation. The second exhortation is essentially uh, an appeal to God's people to examine themselves before coming to the Holy Communion. It's an exhortation and an appeal um, that we particularly think about our lives and think about our hearts as we're coming to the Holy Communion, that we come in faith and that we come in repentance. The third exhortation, if you flip the page, is, um, as the rubric says up there, so the rubric, see that little 
Isn't that called a pilcro? The little, a little mark there. And then the rubric is in italics. On the third exhortation, the rubric says, in the case he shall see the people negligent to come to the Holy Communion, instead of the former, he may use this exhortation. So that would be um, uh, in the case of if somebody was saying, you know, I, I, I'm not going to come to the Holy Communion. What might prevent a person from coming to Holy Communion? NFL, NFL football. Um, but it's true. Um, sickness. Long-term chronic sickness. Now, what is in view of this, particular, this third exhortation is not that particular case. Because if there, but that is a case in which a person might not be able to come to church and might not be able to come and receive communion. In the case of if somebody who has a long-term chronic sickness, the, our practice is that I will go and visit them, and upon request, I will bring them Holy Communion. Um, so uh, particularly if it's something they desire, I'm very happy to do that, and I will do that. I will I'll bring Holy Communion to you um, in your home. And this is a practice that goes back to the very, very early church um, that this was done. Um, but what's another reason why a person might not come to Communion? Yeah. Yes, that they actually, for, uh, they actually uh, have something between a fellow Christian. There's a, a disruption in fellowship with a fellow Christian. What's another reason a person might not come? Cheryl? Uh, unconfessed sin. Yeah, unconfessed sin or guilt, uh, that a person is feeling guilty. And so what these two exhortations deal with is essentially in the, in the I'm going to call it the second one, right? In the second one, what is dealt with is presumption, right? The feeling of, of actually, I do presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, and I am trusting in my own righteousness, right? The first one is dealing with that sort of presumption of coming to the table. Uh, my sins are, that's not a big deal. That's not bad. It's, it's fine. The second one is dealing with the other problem that's possible, uh, sorry, that's the third one. <laughs> the third one is dealing with the other problem that's possible, and that's the problem of a person who is so self-recriminatory. In other words, they, they look at their own sins and they say, ah, no, I can't come. And when you read it, you'll notice that the, the medicine that's given, the suggestion that's given between the second and the third are different things. In the second one, for the person who might be tempted to presume... The medicine that's given is, ah, don't presume, examine. Examine yourself. Repent of your sins. Lay your sins before Jesus. And um, I, I put down there, that, so the three things that this exhortation tells us to do are, first of all, it's telling us to search and examine ourselves, not as dissemblers before God. <laughs> What's a dissembler? What does it mean to dissemble? Lie. Yeah, to lie. We're encouraged to search and examine ourselves, not as dissemblers before God. Why? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to examine our life according to the standard of God's law. We're supposed to confess to God where we've fallen short. And if our sins involve other people, we're to seek to be reconciled to them and also to make restitution for what we've done. And that's along the lines of, um, remember the story of Zacchaeus? Right, Zacchaeus is up in the sycamore tree. Jesus calls him down. Um, Zacchaeus comes to follow Jesus. And then at the dinner that night, what does Zacchaeus stand up and say? For those who have wronged, I'm giving it back. In other words, part of his repentance is he, to, to make restitution for what he's done. He gives back that's what he's stolen. That's what he's taken unjustly. Okay. Natalie. They might, yes. So, uh, how, I mean, I, I understand the, the point that you're making, but you didn't examine yourself and you're not doing the work. Yeah. But also somebody that, that doesn't have any conviction of their sin, how would they then go to Christ? Like, yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. How would, how would a person know who's in that state? How would they know if... 
uh, if they're in this state where they need to repent of their sin. And essentially what I, I think I would say is the prayer would be that the Holy Spirit of God would bring conviction in their life and that he would do that perhaps even by using an exhortation like this one. That, that he would use the, the speaking of the teaching of God's word in the heart of this person that they might repent and turn away from the sins. Uh, but I think it's a great question. Um, essentially what the exhortation is asking us to do is as much as it's possible for us as human beings, don't deceive yourself. Don't be self-deceived. Um, see yourself for who you are. But then it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't say just see yourself for who you are. It says see yourself for who you are and do something with those sins. What do you do with them? You lay them before God. You confess them before God. And why confess them before God? We do that because God delights to forgive us. God doesn't take our sin and, and just, and when we confess our sins to him, God's not like, ha, ha, I knew it. I knew it all along. When we confess our sins before God, because of the blood of Jesus Christ shed, The declaration is, you are forgiven of your sins. Yes, Kent. I think that's a good way to think of it. Yeah, we're, we're agreeing with God uh, of the sins that we have. Yes. I think that's a good way to say it. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you is to come worthily to the Holy Communion does not mean you come sinlessly. Because then nobody would come. Right? When you come to the Holy, to come worthily and reverently to the Holy Communion doesn't mean, well, I didn't sin this week. Yes, great. Now I can come to Holy Communion because I didn't sin this week. Uh, no, that's, that's not what it means. To come worthily means to come humbly and repentantly. That we come with hearts before God of, of humility. Um, now, the, uh, this exhortation goes on to say, well, what happens, though, if a person does this, they examine themselves, they confess their sins to God, they make restitution, but they're still unsettled about it? They still feel stirred up. They, they still don't feel settled. In their, they don't feel quiet in their conscience before God. What then? And the recommendation that's given um, in this exhortation is that then you seek out a minister of the gospel and open your grief and receive comfort and counsel. And I just want you to know that I'm willing to do that. If you want to come meet with me sometime, if you want to set up a time or an appointment, um, if you even want to do it on the phone, um, I'm willing to do that. Um, and notice the reason why it's done. It's done not to say, well, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take if you confess your sins to God. That's not what, that's not what the, it says. It says, if you confess your sins to God and you still feel upset about it, what might cause you if you confess your sins, but you still feel stirred up about it, you still, you still feel, you feel like you're not forgiven, what might cause that? Cheryl? I would say Satan, because yeah, it's sometimes. Like Satan one, and therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And then his promise in Psalm 101 that as far as east is from the west, so far does he the transgressions are away. Yeah. So that the Holy Spirit convicts yeah, yes. Yeah, sometimes it is a lie from Satan um, that uh, that no, you're not forgiven. God doesn't forgive you. Jesus doesn't forgive you. Jesus won't forgive you. Mary. I think sometimes too it can be from the Holy Spirit. I mean, how is your how is your grief detached from anything which will not forgive you if you're never stirred so much that you might tell them? I mean, right. How 
Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's to help, yeah, to help in the shepherding. Absolutely. Yeah. Kent. Sometimes you have to go to reconcile. Right. Yeah. And sometimes, and sometimes we have to make amends, and sometimes we need to have somebody else counsel us to do that. Sometimes we need someone else to say to us, you know, the thing to do here is, is this. Um, and that can, be, that can be hard to hear, but it also can be really healthy for us and really good for us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it can help. Yeah, because one of the things that sin does is brings it, it clouds, it obfuscates, it confuses, it. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, oh yes, uh, you can say it again, Josh. Yeah, and there and there and there is an accountability piece too that can that can come as a result of it. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, I'll say one more. Yeah. While you may confess your sins, you may not believe that someone will come talk to you. Right. I, I so that's absolutely right. So sometimes what you need to hear is from another person. Jesus forgives you for that. That thing, Jesus forgives you for that. Because sometimes, because of, the, because of our flesh, or perhaps the lies of the devil, sometimes we can believe, no, I can't be forgiven for that thing. That thing I can't be forgiven for. And no matter if we confess it to God, or we make restitution, or we do these other things, we still hold on to this feeling of, yeah, but not that. Yeah, yeah. Particularly if it's been something that's become habitual, and um, we can believe, no, I'm not going to be forgiven for that. And sometimes we need to hear, yes, Jesus, Jesus forgives you for that. And here's how now you fight it. Here's how go now go go forward, and here's how you can fight it. Go fight it, and we'll be here with you. The church is here with you as you fight it. Um, a couple of things are implied by this. One, that your minister will know what he's doing. <clears throat> right? I mean, when you said, go to the minister and lay, oh, lay open your grief. Um, you, um, I'm not going to tell you anything that goes against your conscience or something. Like, like um, I do take that very seriously. I, I, um, I want to give you counsel that's, that's scriptural um, and counsel that's coming from what Christ actually says. Tim. Another part of the minister, there's also, is there also some other implied of the trusted brother in Christ that you know your father? Certainly it can be, yes. And it can be that at times you can go, um, the, the, what the thing is, what the, the exhortation is encouraging is don't just turn inward about it, right? But go outward with it. Take the sin and go outward with it. And hear that it can be forgiven. And hear some counsel for how to fight it. I mean, what's also implied is that the parishioner, the person who comes, will receive what the minister recommends. Um, but the hope for result, the result is said at the end, and again, you can read this uh, later today or before next week, is the quieting of your conscience. That your conscience is quieted and the removing of scruple or doubtfulness. So in other words, the, the, the idea is, okay, uh, 
remove the sort of the doubtfulness of, ah, did, did Jesus actually forgive my sins or not? You know, he does. He does. Then the third one, um, this exhortation is about the invitation to the wedding banquet. Remember that, that uh, it's in Matthew, is it Matthew 22? Yeah, so we do read it during the cycle of the church year. It's one of these parables Jesus tells about the, the banquet set out and the invitation goes out and people won't come. Like, no, I, no, I, gotta, I, have, you know, I can't come. They have all these different excuses they give. And the, this exhortation says, no, go come. And it says, if you have something stopping you from coming, if there's a sin that's stopping you from coming or something else is stopping you coming, Repent. Confess it. Lay it down. Lay down your burdens and come. And come and receive from Jesus what he offers to you. Um, receive the Lord's hospitality. Jesus invites you. Jesus says to you, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Jesus calls you. He says, come. Come. Okay, there's way, lots more that can be said, but I already went over the short amount of time I allotted for myself, um, and um, I'm happy to talk more with you about these things if you'd like. Um, I'll stay after, but, um, uh, but let's, let's close in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give to us um, hearts of love for you and for one another. Please, we pray, forgive us all of our sins and negligences and ignorances. And please give us confidence in our Savior Jesus and what he has done for us in the forgiveness that he has won through his cross and through his resurrection. Please bless us through this day and through this week that in all that we think and say and do, we might bring glory to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.